probably have a handful more people filtering in, uh, and that's okay, but uh, not too many seats left. So I'd like to take a moment to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Simon Blackburn. And uh, before we get going, let me uh, give you a little bit of his biography. He is a key figure in the development of precision farming and agricultural robotics with a worldwide reputation. He worked for 12 years in Africa and Europe before starting his academic career. Uh, Simon is currently professor and head of engineering at Parker Adams University. He is director of the National Center for Precision Farming and running the European Future Farm Project. Simon has extensive experience with multidisciplinary collaboration across universities, commercial partnerships and research projects, including design, building, and running laboratories and workshops. He holds seven chairs around the world and lectures on topics including precision farming, biosystems instrumentation, mechatronics, and systems analysis. Simon leads the research in the UK on agricultural robotics. His personal research focuses on improving precision farming by developing more intelligent machines and processes and making crop production more efficient and sustainable. And with that, please welcome Dr. Simon Becker. Howdy. Somebody told me if I was to say that, you wouldn't think that I was from out of state. So, <laughs> and the other thing, I'm very pleased to see the supply of free food work. So if people can turn up because there's something nice to eat, so that's also a good start. So what I'd like to do uh, this afternoon is to tell you a little bit about research that's going on uh, in my laboratories and elsewhere around the world, and I'm sure um, a lot of you are thinking about things like this in terms of um, how can we make the crop production system uh, more efficient than it is. So we've got to find ways of uh, feeding the planet, we've got the opportunity of using all these new technologies. And if we try to take uh, the concepts of precision farming right the way through to its ultimate conclusion, we end up with automated machines and we end up with something like robotic agriculture. So what I'm going to do today is tell you about some of my ideas. Some of the machines I'll show you have already been built. Some of you, I'm sure, may have been building some of these sort of machines yourself. But this is a very exciting time because it's giving us the chance to um, come up with new ideas. I've had a wonderful couple of days with Alex here um, and colleagues in this room We've had some really exciting discussions about new ways of doing things. So, in the next hour or so, um, I'm not going to. I don't think I'm going to teach you anything. What I'd like to do is raise your awareness, and I'd like you to think about crazy ideas yourselves, because it's in these uh, opportunities that we can then generate ideas that might be a, a, a crazy, crazy idea today it might save the planet. Uh, at some time in the future. So, uh, don't be I'm not surprised that nobody's ever heard of this university. It's okay. It's only a very small university. Uh, we've only got about uh, uh, 2,500 students. But the Ag Eng department uh, here and the Ag Eng department uh, at Harper were about the same size 300 students, 20 academics. And we have undergraduate degrees in agricultural engineering, automotive engineering starting a new degree in mechanical engineering. And Alex and I have been talking a little bit about opportunities. We have a one-year master's in applied mechatronics engineering. And so uh, if anyone's interested in spending a year developing and building robots, um, then uh, we have a good cohort of students. Mostly, we have a joint degree with uh, China Agricultural University. And uh, uh, just found out that we've been nominated as uh, University of the Year by Student Returns uh, just a couple of weeks ago. This is a new building we've got at the moment, the National Centre for Precision Farming, and being supported by the politicians. Now, I don't really have a lot of time to tell you about the um, actual research we're doing ourselves. If, if time permits, I'll move on to another presentation. We've developed an autonomous tractor, I'm working on laser weeding, I'll tell you about that. Microdroplet application, robotic seeding, phenotyping, subcanopy robots, uh, and so on and so forth. Because as I say, it's the concepts that I want to get across um, at the moment. 
Agricultural engineering has taken a bit of a decline over the last uh, 20 years when it wasn't so long ago that agriculture was a dirty word. It's changed around. People are uh, coming back to realizing how important agriculture is. And in the UK, the British government is now putting a lot of money into developing this area. And again, just recently, um, we found that we've got uh, 18 million pounds to develop this new um, agricultural engineering precision innovation center with a whole range of companies and other universities. We've got 70 companies signed up. So I'm just, again, raising your awareness there is a lot of development going on there. So, farming in the future. That's often what people say, what's farming going to be like? What's it uh, going to look like? What are the problems and what are the issues? So if we try to predict what's going to happen in the future, one way then is to look a little bit into the past and then draw it through into the future. But one of the interesting things that's come up as I've looked at these uh, systems is that I'm now becoming more and more critical of our current farming system. Talk to any farmer, they'll say they're a good farmer. I won't disagree with that. But the systems that we use today, I'm becoming more and more critical of. And these are some of the weaknesses. Modern agriculture uses too much energy. What I mean by energy is chemical, diesel, big tractors, fuel, and so on, that we tend to spread around. We tend to farm by averages at the moment. And that becomes very waste, uh, wasteful. Large machines and practices are damaging the soil. I'll talk about this in detail later. And why are the machines getting bigger all the time? And that, I would suggest, is through economies of scale. So if you're going to pay a person to sit on a tractor for an hour, it's better that they can do 20 hectares rather than 10 hectares. This is why the machines are getting bigger all the time. But in Europe now, the tractors and combines have now reached maximum size. I'll come back to that. Yeah. So we can also see that there are a lot of new drivers. Why should things change? We need to have a more sustainable food supply, improve on farming and viability, desire to have less environmental impact. We're getting more laws all the time, energy prices increasing, more volatile weather. We have Obviously, in this area, the last few days, we've been talking about the weather a lot more, more competition for world food prices. So I believe that crop production become, must become more flexible and efficient through this concept we're developing called intelligently targeted inputs. So if your fields are like this, you've got big open areas, you can take advantage of the economies of scale. But I would suggest that that is more like uh, the model of uh, an industrial production line, where we're just interested in throughput, interested in maximizing production. Large tractors doing the same work everywhere based on a blanket application of energy. But I think that we need to move to more flexible manufacturing, as industry has done. They've moved into flexible manufacturing, being able to adjust products, being able to change the rates and so on. To react to changes in real time, based on current conditions, but we have to do that with the weather, growth prices. But it inherently becomes more information intensive. We need to maximize the gross margins, man manage risk, minimize environmental impact, and hence the leads us on to all things. So I've talked to economies of scale. So here's a pretty large combine and a pretty large tractor here. But notice that what it's doing, it's then um, on the, uh, that's being loaded onto the flatbed rail truck because, um, uh, oh, sorry, big tractors and large instrument, increasing work rates, we've seen this large capital. They've reached maximum size due to railway tunnels. Sounds odd, but when you look at that combine, why has it got chamfered tops on there? That's to fit through the railway gauge. So when they make these combines, they're now making them to fit through the railway tunnel so they could be transported, so they cannot be made any bigger. So we've now reached our maximum size in terms of the economies of scale. So it's good for large fields, cannot be used in smaller fields. And uh, uh, I was having a discussion just now with the gentleman, there he is now. Small to medium sized farms and fields have the greatest potential for increased production of appropriate technology. 
big change in, it's not the Midwest that's going to be able to produce more food. I think it's going to be the smaller or the medium to smaller sized fields and the medium to smaller sized farms that have the biggest potential to increase yields with appropriate technology. One of my favorite pictures, I'm an agriculture engineer, give me a day off in a big tractor, I'd be very happy to drive around in that. We can all see the tractor is stuck, but I'll ask you a question, what's gone wrong here? Okay, you tell me. <coughs> Why is that tractor stuck? <laughs> Sorry? Mud? Okay, yes, it's driven through a large pile of mud. Anybody else? Very good indeed. Too much weight. Ground pressure. Ground, ground pressure, okay, we're getting there. That's, that, that's exactly right. Um, what, when I show this to farmers, often they'll say that it's uh, too wet. But think about it as systems. You're all systems thinking people. We've got the tractor, we've got the soil, we've got the weather. Which ones of those can we change and which ones of those can we not change? <laughs> you can't change the soil, you can't change the weather, but we design and build the tractors. And so I would suggest that it is the tractor that is wrong, not the soil or the weather or anything else. So that's now making us think in terms of how these machines should be designed. So at the moment, one size fits all. We rarely use full power. Big boys' toys, sure, no problem about that. There is an emotional attachment to big tractors. Go to any agricultural machinery show. You'll see all the, the male farmers standing around admiring this big thing with big wheels and uh, door spikes and so on. But I would suggest that small, smart robots are also fun as well. But um, the need for speed results in what I call a self-fulfilling prophecy. A small working window needs a bigger machine, but the bigger machine, the smaller the working window. What we mean by this, it's going to rain tomorrow. I've got to get out there and plow the field. I've got to go put the seed into the ground in two days' time. And I can't do it. I need a bigger machine. OK, that's fair enough. There's the justification. But what we've seen here is the bigger the machine, the smaller the working window. So we're getting stuck in this cycle, and we, it's, we, we can't get out of it, because horsepower doesn't help when weight is the problem. So we cannot change the soil or the weather, but we can change the tractor. So here we have an example of compaction. Here we've got sugar beet there, and the roots are being limited. Um, I now estimate that up to 90% of the energy going into cultivation is there to repair the damage caused by the large machines in the first place. Ninety percent of the energy going into cultivation is to repair the damage that we have caused. And the repeated damage year after year, and every year we plow, every year we damage, next year we plow, next year we damage, next year, come on. We've got to do something different. If we don't damage the soil in the first place, we don't need to repair it. And the natural soil and flora produce the ideal soil structure. Let worms do the work. Okay, another question. Where do you find the best soil structure in the natural environment? I don't know. <laughs> 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 If you're, from, if you're from Idaho, I agree with that. If you're not from Idaho, I'd say no. <laughs> Anyone else? Jungle. Okay, great. Yeah, forests. Exactly right. The best soil structure is found in the forest. And the reason is you've got a lot of flora and fauna, all the roots, all the worms, all the bugs, creating that nice soil, soil structure, and we're not compacting it. So naturally, we can get ideal soil structures. And so why do we plow it up every year? Why do we damage it every year? Why do we destroy what nature will give us um, automatically? And talking to some of the soil spe specialists at the university here, um, not aware of very much what's called controlled traffic farming in the States, 
It's very common in Australia. Uh, we're doing more and more in the UK. And that's just keeping tractors to the same route every time. You never deviate off those routes. So you get hard compacted routes underneath the uh, uh, tractor tyres and you never go anywhere else. And there are significant savings. So just purely managing where the machines go can give significant savings. So that comes on to the concept of uh, robotics because a um, uh, couple of years back um, I did some work with uh, Nancy Ferguson and they agreed to uh, pay for some graphics here. So these are not real robots, this is all CGI. But it's allowed me to develop my concepts to be able to show you pictures of these things that we can get, use as, as discussion documents. So we're now getting four stages. We're getting establishment, crop scouting, crop care, and selective harvesting. So we need four separate types of machines to be able to do this. So uh, systems concept, sustainability, uh, production, costs, and so on. We've covered a lot of these things. But I will come back to this part here. This is very disruptive. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are no agricultural robots commercially available on the market. There's a few prototypes being developed. But I have regular discussions with all the big tractor manufacturers, and none of them are prepared to develop this any further because it's too disruptive. They're interested in increasing the market share from 32 to 35 percent for long term goal. Next model is always going to try and be bigger, but I've already addressed that. I can't do it any bigger. But uh, they say, why should we invest in this when it's going to break our business model? But it's going to happen. I ask you to help me to try and make this happen because in the long run, this is going to have significant benefits. So it is a system, like we've got a crop cycle, then we've got machines around here. But as we've been developing these concepts, we've come up with radical ideas, ways of doing things that we hadn't really thought of before. And here are some of the disruptive things. So we're now talking about micro tillage, the ability to be able to put seed into the ground without ploughing, without heavy cultivation. If you think about it, um, tractor, tractor means traction. Traction is then pulling things through the soil. Why do you have big wheels on the back, small wheels on the front? It's to allow it to drag heavy metal through the soil or drag heavy things across the top of the soil. And every kilonewton in that direction, you've got to have a kilonewton in that direction. And it's the killing it in that direction that is then killing the soil. So if we stop dragging heavy bits of metal through the soil, we have the ability to then not damage the soil so much. And so we're dealing with micro-tillage, high-precision seeding, geocoding in trees, we've already done that, permanent planting position, position, proximity, and so on. So there's a whole range of new concepts that can come within this system. And we then require uh, some way of uh, making it simpler for farmers. Now, we're all aware of precision farming, precision agriculture. We developed it, started to develop it many, many years ago. But only now, after 20 or more years, is it getting into the mainstream agriculture. We made a big mistake at the beginning when we were developing precision agriculture. And that is that we made farming more complex than a a farmer could deal with. We, as scientists and engineers, we can produce yield maps, soil maps, moisture maps, pH maps. We were love, loving them. But that didn't help farmers make money out of it. It's only a few farmers that managed to do it. So I've learned that lesson. What we now have to do is come up with a system that is easier than what we have currently got. Some of you may have come across this concept of the Gartner pipe cycle. On the x-axis, we've got time, or the um, um, groupings, the classes of uh, uh, these technology concepts. And uh, on the y-axis, we've got visibility. And we've got a range of different systems that we've been using over the years. Some of them, say like auto steer, is now well established uh, in the uh, commercial sector. But as we go through here, Anyone cares? What's, what's, the, what's the fashion <coughs> fashion in high-tech agriculture at the moment? UAVs. 
few of these. So that's Apple software. And I thought that we had actually reached the top uh, with this until we were discussing this the other day. I'll come on to it in a minute. That uh, it's actually second generation drones. And, uh, in that case, we're, we're not up there with unmanned aerial vehicles. We're still down here. We've got a long way to go. But the point is that um, the technology trigger down here is now being achieved by the production of agricultural robots. So we're developing these robots that's allowing us then to consider these new opportunities. We need a farm management information system. OK, this is highly complex. There's all the ins and outs and so on. But somehow, like I said before, we have to have the detail in there to make sure that it's all dealt with. But we have to produce such a sophisticated um, software that makes it simpler for farmers to farm, not more difficult. We've tried to make a start with uh, webfarming.com. So it's an open site. You can go to that site. You just have to put in your email. We won't use the email for anything else. We just want to know who's using it. And then we've got a set of tools here. Um, uh, fields, machinery systems, route planning, route following, GPS, log trajectories, crop rotation plans, and so on. It's Google Earth, so it's all work in, uh, in Texas as easily as work as it works in the UK. And we can then produce uh, route plans. I don't know whether you can see it. It's a set of lines up and down here. When you've got ir irregular shaped fields, it's very difficult to know which is the optimal route to take. Um, so that's how we're getting the information to, to uh, people um, on the web to be able to use the robots. And then you can download the route plan either onto a man tractor, that'll go straight into a triple system, or you can triple auto steer system, or you can put it onto the robots. So robotic seeding, um, ultralight, low draft force, no agronomic compaction. How many farmers would like the opportunity to put seed into the ground, whatever the weather? So you've had all this rains now. I don't know quite how soft the soil will be, but some of the soil will be pretty soft after that rain. You take a big tractor out now, it seems like you've seen. But wouldn't it be nice if the farmer could then go out and put seed into the ground in any weather? Microtillage, permanent planting systems, all these different ways of dealing with the seeds. So I challenged my master students uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I said I wanted a machine that had less than 40 kilopascals, 6 psi under the contact patch. And so they bought a, a four-wheel steer, a long tractor, and robotized it. Being able to turn it into uh, a machine that moves by itself is very simple. Uh, you could do that in a couple of days. How do you make a totally autonomous system? That's going to take a couple of years. It's a big difference. <coughs> steering needs to be very easy. But the interesting upshot of this was that when the tractor stopped over here, I then stood out there, and that's my footprint. Maybe you can just see that on uh, by the following day, my footprint had become flooded, meaning that just the weight of my foot had compacted the soil and the water could not get through. But look at this route here, because that was the tractor route. So the tractor went out at field capacity, is moving around, has the potential to do something useful, and has not done any agronomic damage. So ultralight, no draft force, 6 PSI or less, will actually give us the opportunity to have a machine that farmers do not have access to at the moment. So move on to crop scouting. So working with the agronomist to give near real-time data over the whole farm. We've got the unmanned ground vehicles, and it's interesting at the conference where uh, we were in uh, Baltimore um, a couple of days ago, a lot of discussion about phenotyping, being able to measure uh, the physical characteristics of plants, Matching that up with the genotype works, being able to uh, modify the genes, how are these genes expressing themselves then in terms of the um, uh, physical appearances. So we can do a lot of this uh, phenotyping work uh, from ground-based vehicles. And of course we've had lots of discussions about uh, 
uh, unmanned aerial vehicles trying to do the same sort of thing. Now, they don't compete with each other. The UAVs are rapid assessment techniques, and the UGVs are in more detail. So we're working with a group in Australia at the moment to develop a phenotyping robot um, for um, forage grass. But um, uh, we can do lots of different things in terms of the uh, imagery, so crop cover growth rates, flooding extent, rate emergence, and so on. A lot of non-visible, then DVI thermal. And the sensors are then at the moment limited by weight and power. Here's an example. This is an example of uh, a drone flying over the crop while it's being harvested, as you can see. The tractor's out here, running around. There's a problem with young animals and birds. Birds nest in the long grass, young animals hide in the grass. You've got to be harvesting the sheep and the seed as well. So you can fly over uh, while they're, they're harvesting. If um, wildlife is important, then obviously you don't want to harm the wildlife or um, harm the machine, then to know that they're there before something happens is important. So uh, the, the drone with a uh, thermal camera, one of the concepts we've been talking about, that was a free flying drone, is actually have a tethered drone. So if you've got the tractor and the harvester flying along, you have a very fine wire up to the, uh, up to the drone, and it can take its power from along that fine wire. And then as the machine moves around, this can then look down straight to the front to be able then to sense, uh, sense what's going on. So these are ideas, some of these are concepts, some of these are getting a bit closer to reality. So um, that brings us on to the concept of what I'm now calling second generation drones. So first gen drones are some of the within line of sight, the joysticks, and it's flying around, like most of, like all of the things that you can buy now. But it occurred to me um, a couple of months back that we really ought to be getting into second generation drones, which actually do things for us. So things like uh, spray, seeding, uh, sampling. I know here you've been talking about uh, being able to take tissue samples from a uh, crop cover. Um, the uh, environmental people have got problems if they want to take uh, water samples from lakes, because you can only normally take the sample from the edge of the lake. With a drone, you can go out, drop down, get a sample, or as many samples as you like, from uh, out in the middle. So, um, we have a, within the NCPF, we have a special interest group for drones, we have about 400 members, so it's by far and away the largest group. Um, we do training for drone pilots, so most drone pilots don't know anything about agriculture. Uh, I've had many, many companies wanting to try and set up um, uh, uh, agricultural activities. So we set up a training course for drone pilots. Picocopters to megacopters, picocopters being very small, megacopters being very big, set of UAVs. We're developing the concepts of self-docking, uh, automated logistics, new engines. So we're working with the company that's developing new rotary engines, you know, self-guided, collaborative machines and machines. So lots of uh, new ways of using drones uh, that we haven't thought of before. In fact, uh, we had a, a, a discussion uh, earlier today where we came up sitting around discussing these things and come up with some very, very interesting new ideas that um, haven't thought of before. So I say a lot of this is still good ideas though. So if you have any good ideas of what I'm talking about, write them down quickly because we'll forget about the time we got to the end and we can then maybe discuss some of these ideas. So we're setting up the Agricultural Drone Centre now, uh, part of the National Centre, uh, working with the Civil Aviation Authority like your FAA, Chemical Regulation Director, many drone companies. We're going to build a spray laboratory for credit drones to use sprays. That's the same thing in, in the States here. You're not allowed to use drones to spray yet. But nobody is actually against the concept of using spray drones, but you have to use them the right way. 
So uh, here's a phenotyping robot that I made a couple of years back for vineyards. Uh, so it's based on a quad bike. And uh, um, it then carries the thermal cameras uh, to look at the irrigation status, multi-spectral cameras for nutrient status, and LIDAR for canopy extent and density. So it's effectively um, a mobile instrumentation platform. The, another new concept that is quite interesting now, you're all aware of sampling. You're all aware that things cost money, and so therefore you take one measurement and then you try and extrapolate back to other areas. How about the concept where you don't do something anymore? How about the concept of you measuring everything you want to know? That probably sounds a bit strange. But think about the ability that we've got with LiDAR, the ability that we've got with high uh, resolution cameras. Think about, rather than just taking 10 or 20 pixels from this cloud or a uh, sample, and then trying to say it's an SDR, I can't do anything with it. How about being able to use the LiDAR systems and the camera system so much that we can actually reconstruct a complete model of that system? And the point of that is that if you're then getting a pixel value from hyperspectral, rather than just saying that is just a spectral response from one pixel, and I'm not really quite sure what caused that, if I now know that it's at the tip of the flag leaf at the second stage, at the fourth week, at the third week, then we know the context of that, and we can then be able to produce much better correlation between the spectral responses and any of the other readings that we get, and the geographic. Uh, so we've now got the ability of what I call late luxury data consumption, which then, of course, leads into big data, which leads into cloud computing, which leads into a whole range. But we've got the ability for the first time now in our history to be able to take uh, the level of measurements where we can measure everything that we're interested in. So that brings us on to uh, robotic weeding. So here we've got some lettuces, and would you believe these are weeds? So weeds that big are important. Uh, weeds that big are disastrous. So um, we are looking at different ways in which we can carry out weeding through mechanical weeding. Uh, micro droplet spraying, laser weeding. So I'm sure you're all aware nobody really likes to use more chemicals than we need to, chemicals are expensive. But let me give you another paradigm shift. Here. Think about the <coughs> think about the chemicals. What do we do with the chemical and how do we produce the chemical? Obviously there are active ingredients inside the chemical. And when we go and use it in uh, production agriculture, we spread the chemical everywhere, and the chemical then is good to this plant, it's bad for that plant, and it's good for the environment. That's quite a tough thing to do, to be able to put that level of smarts into a chemical and then spread it everywhere. What I'm now going to talk about is the concept of intelligently targeted inputs. So we can now, I'll come on to the microcropper in a minute, We've now got the ability to be able to only put the chemical onto the weed itself. So rather than putting the smarts into the chemical, put the smarts into the machine that applies the chemical. So, all right, well, I'll come back to that in just a moment. So let's look at uh, mechanical weeding. So this was when I was working in uh, Denmark about 10 years ago. We developed the autonomous factory there, the side ship toolbar, it's both RTK control on there. And we've got something called a cycloid weed home here. And we know the position of every, of the, every one of these plants because we planted it in the first place. So when the seed dropped, it broke an infrared uh, uh, barrier and we could then record the position. There's no rocket science, no artificial intelligence, purely deterministic here, it's just a, just a computer program. But what you can just about see, that cycloid weed is going around. And legs, it's getting too close of course, but the legs are being withdrawn when it comes to the lettuce just drawing it in out of the way. So we can then <coughs> go through the mechanical weeding for that whole area. But I um, wasn't satisfied with this, because look at what we're doing here. There's no weeds here. Look at the size of the tractor. Remember what I was saying about energy, using too much energy? 
even that system uses too much energy. We're stirring the soil when we don't need to stir the soil. We're using a bigger tractor when we don't need that big tractor. So, um, again, when I was in Denmark, some of my old PhD students went to work for this company, Comskilder, and they developed the uh, uh, robotic. Again, the concept of the vehicle, just to show if you're wondering what um, these little things might look like in the future. Um, and so, again, this is a, a PhD student, one of my old PhD students at the uh, University of Southern Denmark. And what he's got in the pot there is uh, a token weed. And the idea is that this is then the micro droplet spraying idea. So we use machine vision to recognize the weed and then only apply technical onto the weed. So we're going to pass the pot through there. We've got a camera on the top here. We've got a light bulb here with all of the LEDs to give us the light form of lighting. And then underneath here, you've then got a spray boom. But it's only a few centimeters wide. So these are commercially available in the cartons, the brown cartons that you see made in China or something like that, sprayed onto it. That's then done with the, um, um, uh, that type of nozzle. So here we've, it's been controlled by a laptop. The arm is just moving it through underneath. So again, it's not uh, supercomputing. That's what the uh, system has analyzed. And there's the weeds having gone through it. And if you could just see the contrast here with the light, look on the leaves. Can you see some blue? Here, and here, and here. Now think about that. We've now got the ability to apply chemical only onto the leaves of the target leaves. So, potentially, we've got a saving of 99.99% of chemicals when you look at the dose weights that is then needed when you're applying these chemicals anyway. Because it's such low um, um, uh, uh, hitting the target, such low rates of hitting the target. And the interesting upshot of this is that the chemical companies have got a whole range of active ingredients that they're not allowed to use now because of the technology that we currently use to apply the chemical. But when we've got the machine that can then, well not guarantee, but can aim at getting 100% on target, we can then be able to um, do things in radically different ways. And then we come on to laser reading. So this is the video that Tom has cheered on. Tom has loved this. I love this video. Uh, here's my weeds and uh, zapping the laser. <laughs> um, it's true that they are hitting into the laser. Note that uh, you can't see any difference after it's been hit by the laser. And what we're doing here is that all of these little plants have got the growing points, the meristem. And if we heat the meristem up to 95 degrees C, the cell walls then rupture, and the weeds then either go dormant or die. And uh, <coughs> um, so we can't see any difference between, but these will either die or, or become normal now. So saving 100% herbicide. And the laser is only a 50 watt laser, meaning that it's less than one headlight bulb on your tractor. So it's not a, not a lot of energy either. And immediately people would tend to think that the chemical companies would be against this, and we're being funded by Syngenta to develop robotic weeding. And so in fact, uh, in the next month, uh, we're going to take our first uh, weaving system out into the field uh, to see how, it, uh, how, how well it works. So uh, we've got the autonomous uh, tractor, uh, and uh, this is uh, what it looks like when it was uh, doing its first tests with the drone. So just going up and down, um, really, uh, looking at sort of the repetition. You can see the um, Flaps and bugs on the front there, we've got LiDAR systems on there and on the front. Uh, lots of stop systems. We've got um, seven levels of safety. In fact, we're talking today, we've now got eight levels of safety and we've got a virtual tensor line around it. So here it's working, it's got LiDAR on the front <coughs> here and they're looking out. And this is then under tests of automatic steering. We've got a gate post here and another gate post here. So it's guiding itself uh, through the uh, 
through the gateway. So that brings us on then to the concept of selective harvesting. Between 20 and 60% of the harvested crop is not of terrible quality. So that's terrible waste. Why is it not of harvestable quality? Where's the problem? You are the problem. I'm sorry to say this. You are causing a big problem. Why? Because you do selective harvesting. See? How come? Well, when you go to the supermarket and you're faced with a, a bench full of lettuces, you pick the worst one, don't you? <laughs> no, you pick the best one. OK, right. So you're quite right. You pick the best one. Well, the supermarkets don't, will not buy the complete crop from the, from the farmer. They will only buy those that they can sell to you. So because you do selective harvesting, what we now need to do is to do selective harvesting in the field. So we need to only harvest that part of the crop, which has 100% terrible characteristics. So we're dealing with the concept of phase harvesting, pre-harvest quality and quantity assessment, great impact and sorting of quantity harvest. So like this gentleman here, um, we're currently working on uh, robotic strawberry harvesting. And what we can do is that we can identify the strawberry, pick the strawberry, use near infrared and other techniques to be able to grade that strawberry. So this one is a, a Walmart strawberry, this one is a expensive strawberry, this one is got a shelf life of three months, three weeks, probably. This one has a shelf life of two days. Um, so we can, we can grade that. And that adds value, because if you can grade it, then you can uh, adopt off desirable attributes, then uh, that will usually have a uh, uh, price. So we grade the quality, size, business, likeness, and minimize off farm grade and sorting. So all the work that I'm trying to do here is to add value to products on the farm. I want the farm to make more money, not necessarily the producers. Okay, so here we've then got the concept vehicle of uh, a robotic uh, lettuce harvester. We can see that there are two parts of this machine, front part and back part. That back part is just the trailer, it's just the logistics, and the front part is the harvest. So on the front here, we then use LiDAR, cameras, multispectral, whatever we want to do to measure the size and quality of the lettuce, decide whether we're going to harvest it or not. Take it inside here, wash it, change it around, put it in the crates. We can pack the crates directly onto the pallet in the back here. When it's full, the, it can then separate into the two vehicles. This one will then run back to the farm. Another one will come and plug itself in. But the interesting thing is that maybe in the bottom there, it's got all the water, the fuel, the batteries, the different things that are then needed to keep the front half moving. So the front half is the harvester. The back half is the automated logistics. But what we can do then, if we only just pick the ones that we can sell today, then what's going to happen to the small ones that we leave behind? We, this is inherent spatial variability, temporal variability. We know that we get this. I'm changing the way in which we do things. Most growers try to get a uniform crop. They modify the environment so that they can do the industrial type farming. What I've learned with precision farming, it's better to recognize natural variability and let's make the machine smart enough to be able to deal with that natural variability. So when we, we've now scanned it already, and now we know its size, and we know that maybe in eight days' time we can come back and harvest these ones. In fact, we've extended the idea even further, but on the back here, why don't we put a seed into the ground every time that we pick up one of these letters? So we've now got a phase rolling, planting, harvesting, planting, harvesting, which is what the growers want to do, which is what the supermarkets want to do. The idea of what we call slaughter harvesting, where they go and just harvest everything and then go and drain it and throw all this away, is very, very wasteful. But if we've got a continuous cycle of growing and harvesting, we can become a lot more efficient. So here's the work that uh, I was doing the other day with stereo vision. Uh, for strawberries, so we can recognise the strawberries, and we can then use stereo vision to be able to work out the distance. And so these are the uh, target points for the uh, robot to go and pick, it, pick them. Uh, and of course, we never touch the strawberry at all. So that's 
So that's the concept then of the um, uh, robotic system that we've got in mind. Mobile robots will be used commercially in arable and horticultural sectors. They're probably going to find their ways into the uh, high value the road crop areas, first of all, because they make more money and hence are more able to invest in these areas. But I don't think robots will be particularly expensive. They will be very disruptive, but we've got to go through the pain barrier to be able to get to the significant benefits. The increased yield, I think, will come through improving smaller fields rather than trying to do the work on big fields. And as I say, we're now designing these new systems and trying to understand the implications. And as a university and as a group of academics and students, I think we're always interested in partnerships to be able to find out how these things work. So with that, I would say thank you very much for your attention. If you damage the merry stem sufficiently, it, it cannot be. Well, it, the, the species dependent as well. Some species will then generate other merry stems and they have other growth types, and so um, that doesn't really count. So more broadly, because the farm, they always have uh, the site merry stems. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's also a problem with the grasses as well, because the grasses have got lots of merry stems in the ground. I have Are there, the 
Well, all I can say is that when we hit the Mary Stone properly through the right way, we get good, good success. Uh, the interesting thing is that, of course, it's a, it's a physical method. Um, and if the Mary Stone doesn't work, you, you can't play Star Wars. We've got a laser, we're controlling it, and we can cut stems, we can cut leaves, we can, we can do whatever we want to do because it's really very small amounts of energy compared to other, other methods. So there are always other ways of doing So to, to get on the issue, you know, how much of that do you plan to have multiple diodes? Yes, yeah, and pollution is always a problem, particularly with the weeds that are in the coast crop area. So, um, but, uh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Other questions? Well, it's not a question. Uh, the stem that you used to Thank you so much for choosing the colors. <laughs> <laughs> you like those colors? Oh, they're the egg color. <laughs> okay. I mean, in fact, there are uh, quite often I get the same questions coming up over and over again. So maybe some of you are thinking about some of these questions. That robots are only big fields. No, I've said that. Robots can be too, will be too expensive. Um, the sort of robots we, we like to take commercially uh, available machines and robotize uh, rather than building up from scratch. And uh, uh, one of the last uh, uh, mobile robot platforms that we have made is based on a, a, a $500 uh, digital robot. It's not a lot of money. So, so what is expensive in sensors and the lasers, the, the clever things that the new technology Robots will reduce the real, real workforce. Um, that's an interesting assumption because big tractors have already done that. So, 100 years ago, we had 20 men and 20 tractors, 20 men, 20 horses, then we had 20 men and 20 tractors. And over the years, the tractors got bigger and bigger, the real workforce has gone down and down. Now, on the farms, we have one, one, one person and one tractor. So, the big tractors have already displaced the rural workforce. But even into the future, we will still need the agronomists, we'll still always need the farm manager, and we'll still need a, an operative. So the tractor driver will need new skills to become a robot operator. So when we're talking about how we develop the curriculum starting now, to give younger people the understanding of how to be able to deal with these systems, this is the sort of thing we need to build into. But it will affect the seasonal labor. Um, so there is a sociological implication of that. A lot of these machines are directly replacing seasonal labor. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on who you talk to. Um, I was talking to a broccoli harvester last week, uh, uh, sorry, a broccoli farmer last week, and uh, we've got minimum, what's called the minimum wage in the UK. And just last week it went up by 7%. He had to take on a 7% loss in his uh, margins to pay this higher wage. He was not allowed to increase his um, price. So when I say to him, do you want to make a property card? So he says, yes, please. Um, robots will do everything. Uh, not true. Uh, they'll be used in niche areas. So we will still need people on tractors, big tractors, particularly for logistics. Robots are not safe. The new system has seven or eight levels of safety now. It's interesting we've got driverless cars going on the road. So why not have driverless tractors? The car is designed to take people around. Why do we want cars without people in? <laughs> tractors are designed for doing things in the fields. And so we've got an even better justification for doing this. Um, but the person is always in charge of the uh, robots. So I could be here talking to you, and my robot could be outside working away here. I'm in charge with it because I've got um, smart phones communicating to it. I've got a heartbeat and back and forwards between my phone and the robot. But I'm in charge of it. Some farmers think, or 
naively would like to then, but they press the green button and the robot goes off. They go on holiday, they come back a week later, check the bank account, all the money to the page. I'm afraid it's not that good. Uh, it's, what we are doing is offering a new set of tools for the farmers. So the farmers have got tractors, farmers have got seed, farmers have got fertilizer. These are all the resources and tools. This is just a new set of tools, but it's then hopefully a lot smarter. Robots are too complex and even operate with the PhD. Uh, again, I take the, the thing as we, we, we don't often need user manuals for these things. These are intuitive, we know how to use these things. And it's a very important lesson for any new technology coming into agriculture. Like I said before, making farming simpler, we have to learn from these people. So the robots that we make have got to be just as easy to use as this. Just one last thing on here. And uh, robots are the, the future. Right now, I say, well, why not now? I think they're clever enough. I think you guys are clever enough to make these things happen. Yes, sir. You cite the cell phone. Um, when you look at certain countries um, in the developing world where cell phones have leapfrogged the mainline development, um, have you approached new? I do a lot of work in China at the moment. And uh, um, when we have been looking both at the local level and at the policy level in China, um, of course there's a lot of people moving from the city, from the rural sector to the cities, it's happening everywhere. And the, the rural population is aging, it's getting older and older people. And um, the production in those areas is getting less and less, to the point where you're getting agriculture and land is not being used because there's no people to be able to run these things. So there, I, we were at a, a, um, a robot demonstration a couple of years back, the robots were doing an academic um, gathering. But literally in the next field, there was a, an old couple who were out there doing this. So I asked the interpreter to come with me and we had a, a chat to them. I said to them, are you attracted to this? Do you, would you like to? Would you like one of these things? They, they sort of said, come on. <laughs> We're out here breaking our backs, working on this. We've got a machine that can work there by itself. Uh, whether people can afford it, and so on and so forth. But yes, I, I think, like I said before, the increased production of food production around the world, I think, is going to come from the small fields. And if you think about the average size of fields in the whole of Asia is about one acre, then the traditional development through uh, a man or a woman with a hoe, a man, a horse, or a cow, and a two-wheel tractor, and a four-wheel tractor. No. If we then think about the ability to be able to get these types of machines uh, that are made locally, sure, we've got to have some smarts in there, and we've got to be able to make sure that it's going to But like I say, like you say about the phone, it's what we have to do is be clever enough to develop all the I've built a robotic uh, irrigation system. Uh, I've built a robotic centre with a robotic sprinkler. Uh, uh, it's interesting there are possibilities with the drip tapes. And they are they're very, very effective. Um, I would suggest it's the same concept, intelligent type of input. So rather than throwing water everywhere, uh, hoping that it's going to be okay, understand it's almost a deficit, putting water just where it is needed, in the right quantity at the right time, is all part of it. Which particular technique we can use, but I haven't got that contemplated. Just a moment, let me just point out that it is five o'clock. I know some people probably feel like they need to go at five, and that's perfectly fine. I think Simon's willing to be here a little bit longer sure. to answer some more questions, but feel free if you need to go to, to step out. So, I said, uh, you know,
smart value that you can make smart value. It's just in the sense that you can have robotic stuff and then you can have robotic stuff. That breaks the concept that I'm trying to follow. So I'm trying to follow it. What we've done in the past is that we have modified the value to suit the machine. So we've taken out edge rows, we've taken out fences, laser planning fields. We're doing all of these things to make it easier for the machine. I'm turning now on the head. What I'm trying to do is make the machine smart to be able to deal with reality. Whether you're then saying it's just a sensor that's embedded in the side, it is, we have that hand. We have a lot of wireless uh, systems, uh, 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 solid moisture, uh, atmosphere, so you can all the parts of it being going into the soil. But of course, it's so much nicer if we can have non contact solid state sensors to do this for us. So, uh, we were talking uh, this morning about uh, the, the electromagnetic induction. To understand the soil better than we've been able to do in the past, and that will continue. So, with all the different um, materials that we deal with, I would suggest in my career the most complex of ever come across is soil. So, whether it's whether it's metal or wood or carpet or any of these, these are easy things. Soil is very, very, very complex. I now uh, believe. Well, my understanding of soil is that it is more biological than mineral. So I think of soil more as a biological medium than a mineral material. That's why I'm saying we look after soil so much better than we do at the moment. Soil is there to give us crops, to give us food. And we're doing some pretty modern things to soil at the moment. So I think we have to be a lot nicer than soil. But understanding the soil, I would not think that would be something. closest to um, commercialization is actually made to the base of the So um, farmers have got problems with weeds. Uh, they will pay good money to get rid of those weeds. And if we, as we are doing, is to develop a system about this bit that could go into the field and kill weeds, that will fit with directly with the current system. We don't need to change anything else. One of the things I've been talking about about not compacting and needing small machines and so on. That takes years and changes the whole system. But the one thing that could go out and be very, very useful to the farmer down the road would be a machine this big 
goes out, works by itself, and kills all the weeds. That's the one that I think is happening with you. Would you say, I know you showed a lot of people from Denmark, is this maybe a hub for this particular uh, type of technology to see the of water out the world? Is there a particular location? Texas A&M is the hub. <laughs> <laughs> Activity in these areas are the ones that are getting funding, of course. So Denmark um, has had quite a lot of funding over the last uh, um, 10, 15 years, so they're still developing very, very good systems there. Uh, of course, Japan, so there's a few groups, Noguchi and uh, Hokkaido, and you know, various other people that are, are developing that. Um, and in fact, the devil one I would say would be California, uh, because there's uh, various companies. That is in, that's a very interesting question because, um, as you know, the concepts go around the world very quickly. Um, we are a very international group and uh, ideas move uh, quickly. But which ones pick up on those ideas and which ones move it to commercialization? And although Britain likes to think of itself as a very entrepreneurial country, um, I can't find the backing for people who responsibly to build these roads. But it happens in California, and hopefully it will happen here. But the, the willingness to invest in new ideas of people with money in their pockets, uh, there's more of them in, in, in the States than elsewhere. So I would expect um, to see some of these uh, first ones coming out here. There's a question back here. So all these tractors and robots who have a lot of sophisticated apparatus and, uh, and sensors. With that, farmers always have problems with breakdown and downtime on machinery. How would you go by that? Well, I, I, hopefully I've already discussed that scenario because um, there's, there might as well be multicolored pixies running around inside there as far as I'm concerned because the technology is so sophisticated. I'll tell you how a CPU works, and I'll explain what GPS is, and how a CCD array works, but how do I, do I understand anything that goes on in there? Absolutely not. As I say, it's not be magic. Um, that's what, the, the, the lesson I've learned, you, you're dead right, I agree with the premise that you're making. All I'm saying is that when we develop these robots, we can't develop it to the point of saying, hey guys, it works. Right, let's go sell it. That's not, that, that will fail. You've got to say, hey guys, it works, now let's spend two years testing it and making it better to get it to that level. As I say, uh, I use it, I charge it, that's all that I do with it, and I'm happy that it serves the purpose. So with the machines we're talking about now, they have to be in that same way. Um, we were having the discussion earlier with uh, reliability colleagues here was asking about reliability, and that's the key issue. You're dead right. It's got to be uh, very reliable. It's got to do what it says on the team. space for a sub -can sub canopy means running on the ground underneath the canopy. So we've got sensors then looking up to see what's going on uh, in the type of spectrum on the lower end of canopy which is like that. And it, if, if it fits underneath other crops, or other things that are 30 inches apart, then yes you can. So crop scouting. But it depends on what it is you're trying to do or what information you're interested in. So, I mean, laser weaving would work in any, as long as the machines that go in there 
So again, it depends on the growth of it. So if you've got six foot of six foot of magnets and you've got a, a, um, a robot reader system this big, you can't work it. But of course, you don't want to necessarily take out three to make it six foot. It's still like okay when you close the camera. But, um, I'm sorry, I can't really be any more specific apart from what I'm saying it depends. So, your concept of it working in multiple areas is right, but it depends on what it is you're trying to do. Let's, let's uh, take one. I think Seth had a question. I was just going to comment on, on Leo's question there, which I think maybe part of what he was asking is. Um, you know, maybe the answer is we're not going to have five hundred thousand or a million dollar combines. These things would preferably be a lot cheaper and almost disposable. So if one's yes. down, you've got a couple of backups, right? Um, the this concept of small smart machines has certainly got a niche, and I think we'll make inroads into this area. <laughs> what I haven't covered is what do you do when you're getting thirty tons of potatoes, sixty tons of sugar beet per hectare, how are you going to deal with that? Well, I don't know. Um, maybe that's automated logistics. Maybe there are ways of... No, I don't know with that one. We don't have a solution. So, um, large logistics are not suitable for lots and lots of small machines. We could deal with swarms. I mean, the concept is there. Each one goes out and picks a potato and runs back. But I mean, that doesn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, it doesn't really uh, so there are areas where it falls down. So, um, but we've got to make sure that it works it, it works well. Yeah. That's, the, that's the point where I think it is a bit. Well, Simon, thanks again for coming.